and to bring you love and greetings from Donna, who's in Calgary, and her mom broke her hip. And so, as you can imagine, that's no fun. And, uh, but I think she's, I know she's watching. Hi, honey. And uh, I'm sure she's pondering, Salama, your comment about having a baby at 60, and followed up by Tulu, your idea of 90. So maybe, maybe we'll be having a conversation when we get back. I don't know, but <laughs> I think in God's grace, right, Gloria? Amen. All in God's grace, all in God's grace. Um, we're happy parents without kids. Not because we don't have kids, because wouldn't it be awesome to have a son like that? Oh, wouldn't it be joy? You guys? Oh, man, these two right here are superstars. Like, I, can you not? Okay, well, anyway, it's so good to have awesome kids like this. And, and it's good for us to have kids around the world because that's kind of what we do. And in Jesus' way, he allowed us not to have kids. Didn't get married till 48. Donna was much younger. She was 47. <laughs> so anyway, we, we love our lives and we love being with you. Data, that was so great what you shared today. Thank you, sister. And uh, oh yeah, that's right. Data one and data two. We got data one and data two here today. Wait a minute, twins and twins is this? Oh dear, bless you. Uh, anyway, I, I do just think it was, it was maybe God's grace that four women came up and shared before today in testimony time. Gloria, bless you, Salama, our dear sister. And uh, that four of you came up, Dada. This is a story about a woman that we're going to talk about today. Her name is Ruth. And I had never really spent a lot of time in the book of Ruth, but I had the privilege of doing that over the last few weeks and filled my heart and blessed me. So if we can um, maybe get started there, we're going we're gonna to read the passage that you heard already. And uh, so this is the beginning of the book of Ruth, okay? And uh, let me give you the setting before we read it. It's about 200 years after, this is about the year 1000 BC, okay? About 200 years before jo uh, Joshua has died. Joshua has passed away, and it's a particular era that we're going to talk about in a minute, but this tells us about a man who was from the land of Judah. He was, he was a, a, father, a, a father, he had two sons, he was a father of the king, and he grew up in the beautiful story of Judah and and our Israelite brothers and sisters. He grew up with the values, right? It came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife, Naomi, the names of their two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and they remained there. So this is about, usually the scripture gives us, I find it gives us truth, and then it gives us a person. This is Elimelech. And I don't know, Corey, if Jess wants to call your little one Elimelech. That's one you could call your child whatever you'd like. It's a, it's a man by the name. He had a name. He was a man. He was a person. And he'd grown up inside the beauty of the kingdom of God, the Israelite people. As they were learning to be a people, he walked the journey with them took a wife inside the story of the good people of the kingdom. And then one day, there was just, you realize there's so much famine. There's a lot of famine. There was a famine in the land. And one of the people named Elimelech decided, oh, this is too hard. <laughs> this is too much famine. It's too much difficulty, too much pain. I'm going to leave the family. I'm going to journey out. I'm going to take my wife, my two sons. I'm going to step out. And if this is in the period called the Judges. So let me just give you a little background on the Judges, if we can go to the next slide there. The best way to describe the Judges is a period of 200 years since Joshua died. And it's like the period between Joshua's leadership and the monarchy, the reign of the kings. This is a difficult time. And you could summarize the judges, the season of the judges, by the last verse in the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Great verse, right? Great. In that little verse, there's so many lessons. It actually is stated three times through the whole season of the judges that they got lost and they didn't really know what to do. So they just did, hey, I'm doing what's right. This is, I'm going to do this. 
This is my story. I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. Now, to give you a little better idea, let's go to the next slide there, Maria. A little bit about the judges. What happens during the season, the 200 years of the judges? This is a, actually from a, from a source that I thought well stated. Uh, it's a pattern. Israel forsakes the Lord. They serve other gods. The Lord delivers them into the hands of an enemy. The people call on the Lord in their misery. He sends a judge to deliver them. Things are good all the days of that judge. But once that judge is gone, the people quickly revert to following other gods. And the cycle repeats. If you follow the story of the judges, which is mostly in the book of Judges, you'll see that's what's happening. They, they don't have an orientation. They have a law. They have a law. They've been given the law. But they don't have enough of an orientation to hold on. So they just keep slipping away. They just keep slipping away. Uh, let's go back to the verse again and take a look at what's happening. So here it is again. This is uh, Ruth 1. Came about in the days when the judges governed. There was a famine in the land. And this man from Bethlehem went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Now let's stop there. A sojourn. It actually kind of indicates in the Hebrew that he kind of went for a while. He said to his wife, I I'm hungry. And it's not working out amongst the family. We got a lot of pain. Uh, I know we're the Israelite people. We've got these deep values God given us. But I'm, I'm going to try and find some. It's sojourn actually means he went for a short while. And where did he go? Land of? Any Moabites here this morning? I just better check. No? No Moabites? Linda, you're not a Moabite background. Anybody know if the Moabites norm? Sometimes you look like a Moabite, Norm. I'm not quite sure, but uh, I, yeah, the Moabites. I don't know. Anybody ever met a Moabite? No, 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 no. Um, it's hard to tell. They've been dispersed. They've been dispersed really all around the world. But where did the Moabites come from? The story of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now just put the Sodom and Gomorrah story in your mind right now. If you don't know what it is, it's not a good one. Sodom and Gomorrah was a terrible dark, evil place that Lot went to and lived in. He remained there. And actually, he escaped with his two daughters, and he ended up in a cave. He ended up in a cave. And let's go to the next verse here. Let's see a bit about what happened. There it is. Um, so Lot, his daughters, he impregnates his daughters. Because they're thinking, ah, we're in a cave. This is not a great future. We need kids. So this, this is not good, right? This is not, not a happy story here. So the older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. Moab was the father of the Moabites. Um, there's another one in the family called Ammon, who's the father of the Ammonites. Moabites and the Ammonites, not Ammonites, Ammonites. Um, so they, they're not starting very well, very difficult situation. Uh, immorality is rampant among the Moabites. They've started really as a result of incest. Let's take a little bit more, learn a little bit more about the Ammonites, uh, the Moabites. Can you drop the screen? Just, oh, do I do it? Oh, you're good. I thought it was electric. Okay. Ah, oh, she's going to the holy switch. And now she's disappearing behind the wall. Okay, great. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to commit identity with the daughters, that should be good, of Moab. Okay, infidelity, sorry. Um, so not only did Moab start, the Moabites started bad as a regard, a bad legacy. They're having a lot of trouble here. So, um, I, you know, you laugh when you see the name of where they are, right? They remained in this place called Shittim. The people began to commit infidelity with the daughters. So now the Israelites are having big trouble. And it's a sexual kind of trouble. It's a, it's a dangerous kind of trouble. Um, and look at verse 2. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate, and they bowed down to their gods. So Israel became followers of Baal. And the Lord was angry. Now watch what the Lord does here. This is, whew. And the Lord said to Moses, take all don't read this, Corey. Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord. 
so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Whew. So Moses said to the judges, each of you kill his men who have become followers of Baal. Now this is a, this is a pretty serious moment, right? You see the seriousness in God keeping his people pure, God wanting to keep his people pure. Um, during the season, so the Israelites gave themselves away to the women. Um, you might have heard of Balaam. Let's go to the next one there, Maria. Balaam actually comes into the story. This is a little clip of Balaam because here's what happened before you read that. Um, the king of Moab said, Balaam, I want you to prophesy against the Israelites. I want you to go and prophesy against them. And he said, no way. He said, no, I'm not, I can't do that because they're blessed. Balaam knew there was something special, unique about them. But watch what Balaam does do. Mosin was angry with the officers of the army, the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds who had come from service. Moses said to them, have you spared all the women? Ooh. Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among them. So Balaam actually didn't curse the Israelites, but he actually convinced a lot of the young Moabite women to go into the camp and cause trouble. This is pretty dark, right? This is a, this is a pretty deep thing. Sexual immorality tied in with uh, idolatry, people pushing young women forward, and the Israelites falling into the story, just falling into the story. Um, you know, there's a reflection from Solomon. Listen to what it said about Solomon to give you an idea. Go to the next one there, Maria. Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. The first two, Moabites and Ammonites. Oh. Ooh. Moabites and Ammonites are the first two in the list. And then see what it says. Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites before and during the period of Judges, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your heart after their gods. So God had kind of seen this ahead of time when he established his people and said, be careful. Be careful. Just be careful because there's a deep value set you've learned and you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. See the last little line? Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Wow, this magnificent person, Solomon, drawn away, drawn away by these serious dilemmas. Let's go back to our first passage again. Came about in the days when the judges governed. There was a famine in the land. Certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to, he went to, he went to go to do. He went for a season. It actually says he went for a season. Watch it go down to the last verse. Now they enter the land of Moab. Did they go for a season? No, they remained there. They remained there. So Elimelech, Naomi, the two kids, they stayed there. They remained there. Go to the next slide. This is the next verses. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Oh, she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women. Do you feel the story getting a little bit... A little hot, a little dangerous. They name, the name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other is Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. That's a long time, isn't it? Lived there 10 years. And both Malon and Chilion also died. And the women were bereft of their two children and her husband. So how do you think Naomi's feeling? Oh, my husband's died. My two sons have died. Naomi's there with her two daughters who are Moabite women that she knows God has said, don't intermarry with the Moabites. You're on the road to trouble. There's a different value set over there than what we learned as the people of God. Don't, don't go over there. Now, let me tell you a little story. I want to tell you a story. It's going to start with a picture here. Oh, that's cool. Do you recognize anybody there? Luciano Del Monte, anybody know Luci out of Guelph? Wonderful leader in Ontario. Anybody else? Come on, he's got top right? That's me. That's me. Okay. 
So I'm growing up in a United Church home in London, and I'm in my teens, and, and I'm starting to make decisions in life. I grew up with a value set, a great value set, but now I get to make my own decisions, what my value set will be. Who will I be? Will I be like my parents grew me up to be? And by Jesus' mighty grace, I fell into the hands of these guys, young followers of Jesus at the university. And it literally changed my life because I moved my feet into their presence. This was a team, Luch Del Monte is in the front right, led our team on the university campus. They saved my life. I didn't know it until many years later, but being among them as like the Israelites staying in that land, and I, I didn't even think about it, it just happened to me. Now I got involved in a little bit of touching the corners of immorality before this time. I had become a believer, I wasn't clear on where I was going, what I was thinking. I touched some things, and I don't want to share the details of you with, but they touched me, sank inside me. But somehow, by God's grace, these people reached out to me, and I fell inside their circle, and I kept my feet inside that circle. And just take a look at the next picture. So I moved in. There you go. I moved in with these four guys. I painted that circle on the wall over by the university at 1511 Aldersbrook Road. We paid $78 a month each to live there. <laughs> Talk about rent change, right? Rent change. So the guy on the left is Dave Banner. He's a bit of a goofball, as you can see. Um, Dave was the goon of Oak Ridge High School. We all knew him as the goon. He went to Western. Life was transformed, picked up on me. I spoke to him on Friday. Dave and I are the dearest of friends. John on the right, Dana. Just, uh, it's okay, well, see the guy in the bottom right? He had become a believer, lived with us for about a year, then we're our friends for a couple of years. About two or three years later, I just want to share this story, although it's sensitive, it's a deep part of my growing up and my learning. His name is Vince. Vince got a job as a boiler maker, which meant he was alone at night in a hospital, in a boiler room. They left him alone. About two years after this season, I got a phone call from Vince. He had been charged with indecent phone calls from work in the middle at night. Now, for those of you who don't know, because we're in the area of the iPhone, in those days, you'd pick up a phone and call. Nobody knew who was calling. So there was a whole conceptual idea around making an indecent phone call. Shocked all of us. We were like, Vince, what are you, what are you doing? For about three to four years, we tried to reach Vince to say, Vince, you've got to leave that job. Because he was alone all night at work with very little to do. It was a context that was killing him. He got fired. He got another job because he was a good boilermaker. He got fired twice in a row. Same thing. His wife left him. Beautiful little boy. A follower of Jesus with his feet in the wrong place. I remember clearly leaving London, getting in a car, going to Kitchener, because he was living there by then, and sitting with him and saying, Vince, you've got to leave that career, that job, that place, that place that you are eight hours a day that is killing you and you don't even know it. He wouldn't leave the job because it was a good income. He wouldn't leave the job. A year later, I get a phone call. He has ended his life. That was my friend. That was my friend. I think of him often. That sorrow inside him of being inside something, but unwilling to move his feet, unwilling to pick up and drop something, be it a job, be it a context, be it people, built up inside him, he ended his life. I was at the funeral with Luch, most of the guys in that first picture, where we just sat and looked at one another and said, life is serious, right? Life is serious. And the choices we make, the places we move ourselves, the people we're around, make a massive difference. They make a historic, massive difference in our lives. Let's go to the next little, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Simple idea, right? 
It's a pretty simple idea that her parents taught us. See, the Moabites, they were the people that your mother warned you about. <gasps> Tommy, that gang you're hanging around, don't hang around that gang. Jimmy, Jimmy, listen, you, you, you need better friends than you've got. You need a context to grow up in. Your mother warned you about the Moabites. See, she didn't use Moabite as a term. But we're all surrounded by Moabites, right? And we're going to live among the Moabites with kingdom love, right? I'm not saying don't leave the world. I'm just saying you've got to have something inside you that says, I'm not going to walk to a place that might, that might give me trouble. The one who walks with wise people will be wise. A companion of fools is going to suffer harm. A companion of fools is going to... You, you can't work against nature. <laughs> I've tried. I'm 64. You can try and work against nature and the laws of the kingdom of the universe. You can't, get, can't do it. Like Vince couldn't do it. I could tell you count, countless stories about how I moved into other settings and they would influence me. They would, they would touch me in ways I didn't even understand until later until later, like the Israelites, right? And God had to send judges. God had to send judges. When you leave the beauty of God's people for something you think is better, like Elimelech, there's a famine. It's, it's better over there, even though they're the Moabites, even though we've been warned, for something we think is better, right? For something we think is better. Now, let's go back to Naomi and see what happens to Naomi. So then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return. Okay, wait, oh, it's 10 years. Now that probably would have been tough for her because of the shame. The shame and the difficulty. It's been 10 years. I've been among the Moabites. I've been among the Moabites. My husband's dead. She had heard in the land of Moab, the Lord had visited his people back in Judah. So she departed from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her two daughters, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, my husband and sons, and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. And this beautiful line, and she kissed them. She kissed them. And they lifted up their voices and wept. Who are the next one there, Maria? We're going to keep moving. They said to her, no, but we're going to surely return with you to your people. Now, both of them said this from what we think. Orpah and Ruth. It's okay, mother-in-law. We're going to go. Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Moriah, just go to that next slide. This line. Now, there's nowhere in the book of Ruth where it says God told them. Elimelech, Naomi... There's no sign that God spoke to them and said, hey, Elimelech, don't go over there. Uh, Naomi, stay with us. Don't, don't go over into that dangerous place. There's no indication of God speaking to them directly, but there is an indication of Naomi feeling something. And these are her words. The hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. You know, it's it's one thing to tell someone else, and sometimes we get nasty and we say, well, the Lord is against you. I see what you're doing, and the Lord is just against you. That doesn't mean anything compared to me saying it for myself. You say it for yourself. It's got, whoo, right, Dad? When you say that for yourself, the hand of the Lord is against me. Who? that's the awakening. That's this deep awakening that happens in a person. Naomi, Naomi has been in the story thinking all these years. Wondering, God, God, what's, what's happening here? I'm over in Moab with my husband. Them things are happening, but we need food. It's better over here. We need food. But somehow in her heart, she cries up. And she has this sense. That, and, and there are times in life, I think there are times in life, where I knew the hand of the Lord was against me. 
Are you with me? Can you, can you remember a time in your life where you're like, yep, that, I was offside. Woo, I was way offside. And then there are times that are kind of mysterious where we just don't know. We just don't know. We're living in a land. I'm not sure if I made a bad decision or if we just got offside, but something's coming up against me. Something is working against me. Something is touching my life. So Naomi makes some new decisions. Oh, uh, let me just tell you about this. This is really interesting. This is um, uh, what's called fire-dependent species. Do you know what fire-dependent species is? Anybody know what those are? A fire-dependent species is actually an idea. I saw a show about a year ago that says that when there's a fire, there's a life that comes out of the fire. There are new plants. There's even animals that are literally dependent on fire. You wouldn't think that, but the way the earth is designed, the way God has made the earth, it's, it's literally that out of ashes comes something new and beautiful. Absolutely. There are, there are plants and animals that literally are born out of the fire of our lives in the same kind of way. I think I'm a fire-dependent species. I think we're all fire-dependent. We all go, Salama, we go through the fire. God knows he's okay with that. He's okay with that fire we're going through because he says something beautiful is going to come out the other end, right? Amen. That's our testimony as humans, right? Now, I want to take you to, to a little verse, Proverbs 20, 24. Maria, if you can, uh, it's not on the slides. I left it back with our brother back there. I just asked you if you'd put up that Proverbs 20, 24. Can't do it? Okay, that's fine. If you can find it, great, but I wanted to put it in here. Uh, uh, Proverbs 20, 24 says, uh, because a person's steps are ordained by the Lord, how then can you understand your way? How, how really, because there are certain times, I think you might have, there you go. Um, there are certain times when you know God's against you. A lot of the rest of the time is just a bit of a mystery. And it's a mystery because if your steps are directed by the Lord, can you really understand your way? I've been in moments in my life where people looked at me. I had a season of difficulty, and I remember a guy sitting with me and saying, Ron, do you know what you're doing? Do you know where you're going, Ron? Man, it rattled me. I thought, I, am I really going to know? Alan, are we really going to know where we're going? You and Maria and your lives? So, well, you know what? The reality is that God holds that strategic piece of our stories. Every once in a while, we know the hand of the Lord is against us. But the rest of the time, it's just a deep moment of humility. A deep moment of being attentive to our lives. Like Naomi is starting to be. The hand of the Lord is against me. Now, I want to give you another verse there, Romans 8.15, because not only are we fire-dependent species, and maybe we can grab that. It'll come up in a sec. Because the dark side of our story is that the hand of the Lord can be against us, either specifically or just generally in what happens in our lives. But there's a truth in the book of Romans that I think we want to just take a quick minute on. There we go. Almost there. Whoop, there it is. No, that's not it. Hmm. You got it, girl. Way to go. That's funny. It didn't turn out. Yeah, here it is. Good. Look at the beginning of this line. Paul is talking about sin and talking about life, and he says, the gift is not like the trespass. What he's saying there is that no matter what you think about this darkness that you've been through, no matter the decisions that you've made, the gift is on a higher level. The forgiveness is on a higher level. The story is at a higher level. He's looking down at this little problem we're in and saying, sister, that might be your little problem, but the gift, the Jesus gift, the the spirit gift, the story of what God wants to do is on another level. Don't worry. I got this. The gift isn't even close to the trespass. Naomi, you're feeling bad. Naomi, you think the hand of the Lord is against you, and you've got to make some decisions. But Naomi, watch me. Watch me. Naomi, you've started to turn. You've decided to go back. Watch me. The beginning of that turn, that humble turn, 
is the beginning of something miraculous in Naomi's story. Let's go back to the story. Chapter 1, it's the next slide there after fire dependent there, Moram. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So both say they're going to go back, but something happens here. Ruth, this amazing woman, makes this decision somehow in God's grace. Orpah kissed her mother, which is sort of a sign of, thank you, it's been awesome, I'm going home. The story starts to change. Ruth clings to her. Then she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return with her. But Ruth said, don't urge me to leave or turn back from following you. I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Right? This is this brilliant phrase that is, is, is seeping around the world in so many settings. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined, ah, Ruth, uh, Naomi said no more to her. Say, so Naomi's like, wow, Ruth, who? Ruth's, and, and people wonder, what touched Ruth at that moment to not go back with Orpah to her people, her gods, her story, where she grew up, no indication she'd been to the land of Israel. I wonder sometimes if it was Naomi's turn. Naomi looking at her and saying, Ruth, I made a mistake. You, you've heard about my people. You've seen the values. I got to go back. I got I to move my feet to where I was that was a better place. And Ruth is just touched. And she makes a decision that is breathless. She leaves her people and she goes back with Naomi. She leaves everything she has. Now you've got her and her mom, single woman, single mother, going back to where they came from, to different gods. But something had touched Ruth's heart. And her statement in here is almost historically a statement that rings around the world at weddings where you go I will go where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. I don't remember if Dawn and I said that at our wedding, but it's said in lots of weddings. Your people will be my people. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Do you know what Ruth means? Companion, friend. That's what the name means. She was the ultimate friend. Loyalty. And God had touched her heart to say there's something in those people of God there's something magnificent that isn't here among the Moabites. I'm going to risk it. I'm going to leave everything I know, and I'm going to go with you. Naomi, in her turn, brought this young woman with her. Even in the ashes of my turn back to God, someone's watching. And in this case, it's someone magnificent. Ruth is a picture for the ages. That's why when the four of you ladies came up in testimony time, all I could think of is thank you. Thank you for being the women that you are, Dada. Thank you, Salama. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, sister. Thank you, because you, you model something to us men that is just like Ruth. Loyalty, honor, wisdom magnificence. You model something of such greatness. Ruth was a straight arrow. She was a straight arrow. And you know what's interesting is in the story of the Israelites, I had to ask myself the question, were there other people like Ruth that came out of the other nations? Like were there thousands? Of like, you know, Because you don't hear many stories of people who came out of other nations or people groups and joined the Israelites, right? Well, according to, you can go to the next one there, Moran. Um, there may only be, uh, oh, oh yeah, right, okay, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, okay, here's one. Go back one, there you go. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem, and when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Is this Naomi, 10 years? 
She said to them, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. This is more than just the hand of the Lord is against me. I went out, listen to this, I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? These are deep words. She's on her way walking back with Ruth and the depth of his, her journey, her processing of where she is rises up in her, rises up in her deeply. So Naomi returned and with her Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. This was not a part of the 1 to 18. It's the next three to four verses. And I put it in there because you see this journey Naomi is on. And Ruth watching. Ruth listening. And Ruth's idea about the kingdom of God, a seed growing. A growing. And from here on out, this is the end of chapter 1, from here on out, and we won't do it because it's just Ruth 1. From here on out, Ruth steps into this magnificent story with Boaz, a man of noble character in Judah who marries her. A man of noble character with a woman of noable character. A Moabite woman. Ho. Oh. A Moabite woman. And I mentioned, go to the next one then, then, Maria, thanks. I mentioned this question. I asked myself, well, lots of people must have joined the Israelites. No. According to what the scholars say, there's only Rahab, who was a, a harlot. She was a harlot. The Gibeonites, a group deceived the Israelites. It's kind of a group. Uriah the Hittite. And a thing called the mixed multitude. It, it, as you read the scripture, you realize not a lot of people came and joined Ruth was a rare breed. Ruth saw something in Naomi's repentant heart, her turn, and it brought her back. It brought her to, not back. It brought her into the spirit of Jesus. Now, the, if you know the story, the magnificent part of the story, and we're going to uh, take a look at the next verse here because who's Ruth? These are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon. I didn't know Salmon was in the Bible. It's kind of interesting. Salmon fathered Boaz. So there's a man in Judah, a man in Judah who marries Ruth. Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And who was David's mother? Ruth. Two up. Grandmother. <laughs> right. Great grandmother, right. Ruth finds her way. Ruth finds her way into this. May is it grandmother, great grandma? Boaz fathered Obed, Obed father Jesse, Jesse father David. So God, out of the ashes of the Moabite people. Out of the ugliness of the Moabite people, one woman is found loyal. One woman, God, after all those 200 years of the judges, looks down and says, that woman, Ruth, I'm going to be the beginning of something amazing with her. She can stand out against all others. It doesn't matter the Moabite. It doesn't matter what Lot did. It doesn't matter what the daughters of Lot did. It doesn't matter what the Ammonites did. It doesn't matter what the Moabites did. It doesn't matter that my people are struggling. Ruth, she's a shining light. She's a shining light. And I am sincere when I say today, I want to thank you for the women of this church. We honor you. Ruth, the great, great grandmother of David. God chose her. Because the next story after Joshua and the kings is the monarchy. And David begins a whole new story. Who has his own trouble, right? God has a way of just pulling us out of the ashes, every single one of us. I wish Vince were with us today. He'd be one of my best friends. I wish he was. Maybe he stayed too long among the Moabites and Ammonites. Maybe he didn't come back. 
All I know is his pain was so deep he ended his life. But we can move our feet. And in moving our feet, I think someone else will be drawn forward. Whenever I move my feet, someone kind of tags on. Somebody hangs on and sees what I'm doing in humility and says, that's a better way than the pride of the Moabites or the Ammonites or the sexual promiscuity or the abundance of whatever they experienced. I want to go the humble way. Ruth is an angel of the scripture, an angel of the scripture, an example and a model. And I do want to just say thank you to the women of Mosaic because I feel a tenderness towards all of you. Linda, thank you. Yeah, Yoni, thank you. Dada, Diane, many others I have. You know, Gloria, we love Gloria, right? Um, her birthday yesterday. Thank you for being like Ruth. Let me leave you a verse. I love this verse. This was the verse that was on my heart when I married Donna. What a stunning verse in Proverbs 31, because they say Ruth is the Proverbs 31 faithful, loyal woman. Look at this. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future. You're not going to get Ruth, because if you follow Ruth, if you read chapter 2, 3, 4, she goes through a lot of junk. She just smiles at the future. She's like, I'm not in Moab anymore. I am not in Moab. I am with my brothers and sisters. She smiles at the future. Strength and dignity. Two beautiful words. Two beautiful words. Maria, bless you. Two magnificent words. And uh, so maybe the hand of the Lord is against you today. Maybe you feel that deep. Maybe you just feel the mystery of I'm not sure, but I feel like something's against me. Take the road of humility. Take the road of humility and repentance. Let God guide you. Let God guide you in whatever's aching in your heart. Someone's watching you and wants to know the God you know and will join you. And for the men as well, strength and dignity could be the men's clothing as well. We ought to smile at the future. But women, thank you for doing that. And for those of you who are experiencing the hand of the Lord in a dark way, come and talk to us. Talk to me, Norm, any of the